my name is Suzanne Archie and uh, I'm a psychiatrist and um, <clears throat> I've done early intervention in psychosis uh, for about 30 years. How would you explain the link between uh, cannabis and psychosis? Well, first, it would be important to explain uh, what we mean by psychosis because it is a, different con a difficult concept to understand. So when people are experiencing psychosis, they can have uh, disturbances in their perception. And of course, the saying, seeing is believing, is uh, very germane because if people are perceiving the world differently, then their thoughts and conclusions are going to be based on how they're perceiving things. And so if they're perceiving the world differently than other people, then they're going to come to very different uh, actions, behaviors, thoughts and feelings than, than people who are around them. Um, and so <clears throat> the other issue related to psychosis is that people can have confused thinking or speech, and that may be related to how the nerve cells are functioning. Um, so uh, it can be sometimes difficult to understand uh, what, they're, what they are saying, um, or, or their speech patterns may be um, speeded up or slowed down. And uh, these symptoms affect daily functioning in terms of school, work, or interpersonal relationships. And uh, people can also have mood disturbances along with that. So like irritability, depression, or suicidal feelings. So it's important to kind of understand that psychosis is not really a diagnosis, it's a syndrome that can be associated with a number of different kinds of, of uh, conditions and problems. So people can have psychosis uh, as part of an illness like schizophrenia or bipolar illness, but sometimes people can experience psychosis as part of an intoxication syndrome with uh, too much marijuana where their brain uh, is just exposed to more THC, and I'm going to talk about THC in a minute, marijuana, then um, it can handle. And so this is sort of a short-term kind of psychosis effect that clears once the euphoria uh, clears. Uh, but people can also experience what we call cannabis-induced psychosis, which is a more serious medical condition where people will experience psychosis symptoms for up to a month after they've stopped using marijuana. And uh, sometimes people will need medical attention. They might need to go to emergency or even be hospitalized uh, because of uh, cannabis-induced psychosis. And then people can have an underlying psychotic disorder like bipolar illness or uh, most commonly we think of schizophrenia where a person will have psychosis symptoms for at least six months, and uh, these symptoms can affect their, their functioning. So <clears throat> there is uh, a very complex relationship between uh, cannabis use and psychosis. Um, not everyone is at risk of developing psychosis. Um, <clears throat> many people can use marijuana safely and um, recreationally and not have any um, or very minimal harmful effects. Um, but there are situations where people are at much higher risk of developing psychosis. So one of the most important factors is age of first use. So we know that youth in particular under the age of 19 years are more at risk of developing psychosis um, if they, the, the literature suggests that, you know, regular use, so three times a week or more in somebody, say, between the ages of 14 to 18 uh, years of age, <clears throat> that can lead to uh, subsequent uh, psychosis, usually a couple years uh, uh, later, and there have been numerous epidemiological studies uh, going back to the 1980s demonstrating this. So there's 30 years of very solid epidemiological evidence uh, supporting this. Um, 
it's also the frequency of use. So someone who you know is using less frequently is much less likely to develop um, psychosis. Um, but there's also genetic vulnerability. So if someone has a family history of serious mental illness or schizophrenia, then uh, if youth use marijuana and they have a genetic vulnerability, it's almost like the marijuana increases the chances that that youth could experience um, psychosis symptoms and um, express that uh, genetic vulnerability. And then another important factor is THC and CBD. So THC is tetrahydrocannabidiol and uh, CBD is uh, cannabidiol. And these are, there are about 500 different compounds in marijuana, but these two particular compounds are the ones that scientists and researchers focus on the most. So THC content of marijuana is very important because THC is the component that's been most associated with euphoria, but also psychosis and also addiction. And so uh, the THC content of the marijuana that's available, certainly on the street in Canada, has had marked increases in the THC content. So for centuries, the THC content for marijuana or marijuana grown in Jamaica or in Mexico was about 2% to about 5%. But in order to grow marijuana in Canada, people discovered that the higher the THC content, the better it, you know, the, the better it was for um, growing marijuana in cold climates. Uh, and so the THC content uh, can range anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. At the same time, the CBD content in marijuana, certainly that's been available on the street, has remained relatively constant, around 2 percent or 5 percent. So the balance between THC and CBD has changed. And CBD has been associated, certainly um, in terms of research, with anti-anxiety properties and also antipsychotic properties. So the change in balance of uh, THC and CBD may have also contributed to the increased risk of developing psychosis among youth. We, there, there have been a number of studies that show that the potency of marijuana um, predicts the likelihood of uh, developing psychosis. So for example, there was a big study done in Europe that showed that people who used marijuana that was grown in Spain um, had much lower risk of developing psychosis than people who were using marijuana that was sold in the UK. And a lot of that was related to the fact that the potency of the marijuana is different uh, when the marijuana is grown around the equator versus um, marijuana produced in a colder climate, which has you know THC contents of 15 to 30 percent. So just to summarize, you know there is a link. Um, it's based on potency, it's based on THC and CBD content, the age of first use, frequency of use, uh, and genetic vulnerability. But that's talking about the risk of cannabis-inducing psychosis. But there's also a link between psychosis and cannabis use. So there have been studies involving twins that have looked at um, the rates of cannabis use. And it appears that people who have a genetic vulnerability for psychosis also have an increased risk of using marijuana more frequently. So, um, you know, having a family history of mental illness 
can also increase the risk of using marijuana on a more regular basis compared to people who don't have genes or genetic vulnerability for psychosis. So the link is bi-directional, it's not unidirectional. It goes both ways, uh, making it very complex. Mm -hmm. And I think that complexity can be really hard to untangle sometimes. And in those like broad pictures, it can be hard to see as an individual when use starts to become problematic. So how can someone know when their cannabis use is becoming problematic and or might be headed towards an episode of psychosis? So there are about three main factors that doctors look at to decide whether somebody's cannabis use is becoming problematic or an actual disorder. So the first thing is the degree of impairment or distress. So is there cannabis use associated with less time at work, difficulties at school, interpersonal relationship issues, um, uh, their, their occupational functioning? Um, another um, important factor that uh, we look at is whether there's evidence of tolerance. So does the person need higher and higher doses of the cannabis to achieve the same effect. So we see that in a youth, they might initially use it, what we would define as recreationally. So they, you know, maybe just use to chill out and to have fun with their friends. So, you know, they might use it one or two times a month or something like that. And that ha wasn't particularly problematic for them, but maybe the youth had some stress or, um, things were going on and they started maybe using it not so much with others and not so much infrequently. They started using it because if they, you know, they had to use it every day, maybe to sleep. And if they didn't use, they wouldn't be able to sleep. This is some evidence of the person developing tolerance. And um, sometimes a person actually has to use in order to feel normal. So if they don't use, you know, they start to feel irritable, anxious, they can't sleep, their, their weight goes down, they're restless, they may be depressed. Uh, and these are all signs of withdrawal symptoms. So the third thing is that the person starts to experience withdrawal. And certainly, uh, you know, if somebody would say, for example, using marijuana fairly regularly, say every day, several times a day, and then they go a whole week without using marijuana. Well, that might be a situation um, where the person might start to develop some irritability, their anxiety gets worse, their sleep gets worse. And, you know, further and further they go along, eventually they may start to experience perceptual just changes. They might hear things or see things or become suspicious or paranoid. So the withdrawal symptoms can certainly be a sign that their cannabis use is, is becoming a problem. Yeah, so there's those three big pieces. So um, how, how would someone know they're heading towards an episode of psychosis? Is there any, any sort of clues or anything that they can pay attention to that would like indicate to them that something might be going wrong? Well, they might notice that um, they that other people are not perceiving things the same way that they are, that they might misinterpret uh, what other people are saying. They might start to feel scared, suspicious. Um, they might be seeing things um, or hearing things that other people deny saying or say they don't see. Um, and then usually there are what we call vegetative or um, body symptoms, such as insomnia, not being able to sleep, uh, poor appetite, feeling agitated, poor concentration, memory, fluctuations in their energy. Their energy can be too high, at other times it could be too low, and they don't feel like doing anything. They become very amotivational. Mm. So 
what would you tell someone who thinks something might be wrong? So might, maybe they have a couple of the, the symptoms that you were talking about earlier, uh, but doesn't think it's that serious yet. Well, first of all, society in general sees marijuana use as being part of the cultural norm. And so therefore, you know, it can be very difficult to identify that you're having a problem when in fact all your friends are doing the same thing and, you know, everybody feels that, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. And in many situations, that is the case. So it can be very difficult to recognize that maybe you're starting to have an addiction or a medical problem. And it's not uncommon for people to be in denial about the consequences and the impact of their marijuana use, again, because it's normalized and so many people uh, use it without any difficulty. If the person notices that they're taking larger and larger amounts than what they initially like to use or that they had intended, that would be a sign for them to think about, okay, maybe I might be having some difficulty. Or conversely, if the person is trying to cut back, but they're unsuccessful at doing it, that may too suggest um, that they're, they're starting to have some serious problems with it. If they're having difficulty fulfilling their regular roles and responsibilities, if they're having difficulty getting up on time for work or focusing and concentrating at school, these may be signs that, okay, it could be having an impact on them. If it's interfering with their interpersonal relationships, you know, if they're getting into fights with their girlfriend, if, um, you know, they uh, don't feel like being around people, they want to withdraw and they feel like isolating all the time, that may be another sign. And then finally, you know, if people are using in dangerous situations, so, you know, um, they're smoking and then they're driving or, you know, they using marijuana before going into work or, or you know, they're, they're, they're responsible for caregiving for their children. These are all signs that, you know, their use may be serious and mm. that they might need help uh, to try and uh, deal with that. Thank you. So switching gears a little bit, um, I want to talk a bit more about the psychosis piece. So how can someone who's never gone through psychosis understand an episode of psychosis? Well, first of all, psychosis is a very difficult concept to grasp. And most people in society have difficulty understanding it. There's so much stigma and so much misinformation about psychosis. So for example, because psychosis is in the media and the media associates psychosis with violence, sometimes when I tell patients that they're experiencing psychosis, they'll say to me, but Dr. Archie, I've never been violent. And I have to explain to them, yes, I know you're not violent. Psychosis is not about violence. Um, and it's not about having a split personality as well. That's another big mis misconception about psychosis. And a lot of that is also because psychosis is an experience and it's a sensory experience. And language is not really good at capturing what that actually means. And so that's the other part. Like some people think, oh, well, you know, oh, they're just imagining things or they're making it up or sometimes people say they're lying. And so often what happens is people with psychosis then don't feel comfortable telling other people that they're experiencing it because other people just often don't get it. And it's not that the other people are being insensitive or mean, it's just, it's a very difficult concept to, to grasp. Mm -hmm. um, once you understand what the individual is experiencing, so what they may be seeing, what they may be hearing, what they may be misperceiving, once you appreciate that person's reality, then 
their behaviors and their actions make perfect sense. And the, the reality is, is that anybody who would go through an experience like that where they might hear other people saying mean things about them or seeing uh, things looking altered and strange, anybody having that kind of experience is also going to, you know, become paranoid or, you know, become suspicious of other people. That the psychosis makes sense within the context of what that person's experiencing. The psychosis does not make sense when you are looking at the same reality and, you're out, and your reality is very different from that person's reality. But once you understand what the reality is of the person who's experiencing psychosis, then their behavior is predictable and it makes, uh, it, it, you, it, it makes uh, sense to other people. Mm. And I know you've been working on a video game to help people kind of understand uh, the process of like going into an episode of psychosis. So tell me a little bit about uh, Harry's journey. Sure. So actually we have video game technology is actually ideal for raising awareness about psychosis because it's experiential and it shows rather than tells people about psychosis um, symptoms. And so we've actually produced um, the Back to Reality series, which is a set of three video games um, that we're currently in the process of testing with youth to see how effective it is. So. Um, the first video game is about uh, Harry, who is a high school student in his senior year, who'd been using marijuana since he was about 14 years of age. And in his last year of high school, he starts to experience a lot of anxiety, psychosis, irritability, and he has to make choices about what he wants to do, what he wants to do about his marijuana use, whether he wants to seek help or not. And so the video game helps the player to make choices for Harry and then see what the consequences are of Harry's choices. So that's one video game. And then there's another, it's called Harry's Journal. And it takes scenes from Harry's journey. And uh, it's kind of like um, the old Trivial Pursuit game. A lot of youth won't know this game. It came out, I think, in the 90s. But basically, it's like you have to click on the right answer. So it's a way of consolidating knowledge about what the symptoms are associated with panic attacks or depression or hallucinations, those sorts of things. And then uh, the third is a, uh, uh, a digitalized map of Hamilton. So it's colorized but it has all the locations of youth, mental health and addiction services on the map. And um, the players can click on a service. And then when they do that, they can actually have, uh, a, they can see what the service looks like, say before they even go there, which might help reduce anxiety about going to get help from a place. If you can see not just the outside, but also the inside. And then you can click on an icon of Harry or Harry's mother and Harry or his mother will explain why they went to that service. And then there's a staff. You can click on a staff and the staff will explain what they do and you know what uh, kinds of help that they offer so that someone in need of help can actually have a sense of what the service does before they get there. So that's the Back to Reality series. There's also Debris. Debris is a commercial video game uh, that uh, Moonray Studios and Hamilton created. And uh, The Good Shepherd uh, at McMaster University, uh, we formed a panel or uh, a, a board, an advisory board to Moonray Studio to help them create um, psychosis-like simulations in uh, the video game. Um, and uh, it's now been um, bought out by PlayStation 4, and it's also available on Steam. 
So uh, research has suggested that uh, video games are actually a viable strategy for simulating psychosis-like experiences um, and helping youth uh, learn how to help seek. There have been uh, studies uh, conducted where, um, I guess, um, enhanced um, 3D, uh, 3D, uh, the, the goggles um, have been used to help people who actually have psychosis use cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with different situations. And uh, this research has shown that it can be actually uh, quite effective uh, for, for treating psychosis with cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also a game Sparks that, that uh, uses um, avatars to help people learn cognitive behavioral therapy and to treat depression. Um, so uh, there, there, there is a growing uh, body of literature to suggest video games are helpful. And we're currently in the preliminary stages of testing Harry's journey to see whether youth learn about the relationship between cannabis and mental health through through playing the, the video games. Yeah, I think that's an amazing market to tap into, especially for, for youth. Because um, I know I know a lot of people play video games. Um, so going back and Sorry. just one one last thing is that now the next phase of what we're trying to do is have online tutorials facilitated by undergraduate students, either yeah undergraduate um, students, say in the Bachelor of Health Sciences or medical students, so that they would facilitate the learning of say high school students. So the high school students could play the video games as their homework, but then in the tutorials, they could discuss the science, they could question the science, um, kind of work with it to kind of have a better understanding so then they can decide what they want to do um, uh, for themselves. They would have a knowledge of the information so they could make better choices for themselves based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so um, you kind of get like that knowledge, the synthesis of knowledge, right? Because you have the experiential part through playing the video game, and then you get all the science and everything behind it when you have that uh, that debrief. So debris is already out uh, commercially, and people can can get it. Um, when is Harry's Journey going to be available for people to, to well, start going to? Well, that I'm not sure. Okay. And that I'm not sure. I I also have to say that. Um, there is going to be um, a French version. So McGill, uh, Dr. Manuela Ferrari, uh, who's a colleague of mine, uh, she is in the process, she has some funding to convert uh, the Back to Reality series into a French version so that people in Quebec can also have a Pathways to Care game that uh, identifies uh, mental health and youth services in Montreal and, and Quebec. And it, of course, the game would be translated as well. That's amazing. It's, uh, it's going to be far reaching. Yes, yeah. it's, it's fun. It's really great to, to work on this project. Mm -hmm. So going specifically for uh, cannabis. So we talked a bit about um, how cannabis can be linked with psychosis, what psychosis is like, and the risk factors. So going to the other side, like protective factors. So what sort of harm reduction methods can people take on to uh, mitigate any risks from their cannabis use? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, alert people to CAMH uh, because they have put out the low risk uh, cannabis guidelines. Um, and I think that that is very well researched and studied and uh, very helpful recommendations. So um, in many ways, I think uh, it, I, I just want to reiterate some of the things that they mention. Uh, for example, uh, they suggest that youth wait till they're older, um, just because, you know, as your brain matures and there's uh, better protection of the nervous system uh, that helps 
youth um, if, if they wait till they're 19 or older uh, before they, they use. Um, they also talk about um, the fact that if you do use, uh, try and low, use lower strains of THC. Um, also, they um, advise against mixing marijuana with alcohol or other street drugs because you potentiate the effects of the other street drugs. So that's an important thing uh, to remember. Um, they uh, talk about, uh, you know, driving and the concerns that uh, marijuana can in fact impair driving. Um, it does so differently than alcohol, but it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they don't talk about vaping uh, in, in there. There are concerns about vaping that I think uh, at the time when they were developing this, uh, doctors and researchers didn't know about. Um, so certain types of products in the vaping, uh, that you use in the vape, vaping machines can um, cause damage to the lung. So, so that's really important to, to also be aware of um, and uh, keep, keep in mind. Um, and, you know, watching the frequency of use, that trying to keep your use recreational and avoid getting into daily, uh, you know, or, or regular weekly use, um, especially if you're under the age of 19, because uh, there's dose effects of, of uh, marijuana. Thank you. Um, I guess to end this off, if you had, if you could make one piece of information about cannabis known to everyone in Canada, what would it be? Uh, that Canada has some of the highest rates of youth addiction to marijuana in the world. Uh, we're right up there at the top. I don't think most Canadians are aware of that. Um, and that it's very important for Canadian society to protect youth. Um, but not by just saying you shouldn't use this. I don't think that's a very effective way. I think it's helpful for youth to actually have the scientific knowledge and information uh, because they are bright and intelligent and uh, many of them uh, may not be aware. And so education is really very important. Awesome. Thank you. Was there anything uh, that we didn't get to talk about today that you're hoping to say? No, I think that was great. Perfect. Thank you well, for this opportunity. I really want to thank um, the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, and I I'd like to thank you, Elias Comis, for um, hosting uh, this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Archie. Re we really appreciate you taking the time, and we know everyone's going to be able to benefit from this. I know even having worked alongside you, I've learned so much, and you're such an amazing amazing person and resource and just, yeah, you're, you're spectacular.